In this segment, we will look at what operations a data structure representing a graph should support, and two very common data structures for representing a graph, the adjacency matrix and the adjacency list. So what operation should a data structure representing a graph support? Well, we somehow need to get our graph into the data structure. So a desirable operation is to be able to add an edge to the data structure. This way, we can at least build up our graph progressively by adding each edge one at a time. Another question to ask is to check if there is an edge between two vertices. If the graph is weighted, we would also want to know the weight of this edge. Perhaps it's not as obvious, but it turns out that a critical operation for our algorithms is going to be to iterate through all the vertices adjacent to a given vertex. I'm going to give this operation a gold star because, because it is actually the only operation on the graph we will need to implement all our algorithms. This has some really interesting implications that we're going to talk about later. So there are many other possible operations that you might like to perform on a graph, depending on your application. So that might include removing an edge, adding or removing a vertex, returning the out degree of a vertex. But we're actually not going to need these operations for our algorithms. So uh, I'm not going to discuss these operations. There are two standard data structures for representing a graph. For this example, I will talk about the most general kind of graph that is both directed and weighted, like in the picture here. So the first data structure is called an adjacency matrix. If we have a graph on n vertices, this is going to be an n by n matrix. It has n rows and n columns. In our example here, you see we have a four by four matrix. The entry of this matrix in row i and column j is zero if there is no edge directed from vertex i to vertex j. And otherwise, if there is an edge directed from vertex i to vertex j, then the entry is the weight of that edge. I'm using zero indexing here. So if we look at the entry of the matrix in row zero and column two, we see the value two which is the weight of the edge directed from vertex zero to vertex two. The second standard data structure to represent a graph is called an adjacency list. An adjacency list is an array of singly linked lists, one for each vertex in the graph. The linked list associated with vertex i has all the vertices out adjacent to vertex i and the weight of the edge between them. So in this example, the linked list for vertex two contains vertex one with associated weight 1.5, vertex zero with associated weight one, and vertex three with weight 0 0.5. The nodes in this linked list can appear in any order. And note that we only have nodes associated with the outgoing edges, not the incoming ones. If we look instead at the list for vertex one, you see that we just have an empty list because vertex one has no outgoing edges. So the entry of the array corresponding to vertex one is just a null pointer. If the graph was unweighted, then the adjacency matrix would just be a binary matrix. Every entry would either be zero or one. And in the adjacency list, we would not have to store the weights of edges. So the nodes in the list could just hold the names of vertices. Now let's talk about the undirected case. Consider the edge between vertex zero and one in the picture, which has weight 0.8. In the adjacency matrix and adjacency list representations, we essentially view this edge as two directed edges of weight 0 0.8, one going from vertex 0 to vertex 1, and one going from vertex 1 to vertex 0. So we see that in the adjacency matrix, both the 0, 1 entry of the matrix and the 1, 0 entry of the matrix have the value 0 0.8. As this is true for every edge, 
This means that in the undirected case, the adjacency matrix is always going to be a symmetric matrix. That is, the ij entry of the matrix is always going to be equal to the ji entry of the matrix. In the adjacency list representation as well, the edge between vertex 0 and 1 appears twice. It appears in the list for vertex 0 and also in the list for vertex 1. So in other words, when we add an undirected edge to the adjacency list, we're going to add it in two locations. So when we add the edge i, j, we're going to add it both to the list associated with the vertex i and the list associated with vertex j. Here's a simple starting point for an adjacency matrix implementation in C++. So we have a template argument for the number of vertices in. <clears throat> this means that we do not have to dynamically allocate memory for the matrix. So there's our definition of the matrix. So we can just define this matrix on the stack. In this example, we only consider unweighted graphs. So the adjacency matrix is just a matrix of Boolean values. We also have another parameter, is directed, which lets us handle simultaneously both the directed and undirected case. So if is directed is true, then in the add edge function with input arguments i and j, then we're just going to set the ij entry of the matrix to be true. So that represents a directed edge from i to j. If is directed is false, then we're additionally going to execute this command in the if statement there, and also set the ji entry of the matrix to, to true. Uh, the is edge function is also very straightforward. So with input arguments i comma j, i and j, we just return the i comma j entry of the matrix, which indicates whether or not there is an edge between vertex i and vertex j. So we see that both Add edge and is edge, both of these functions just take constant time. Here's a simple starting point for an adjacency list implementation. So we again have a template argument for the number of vertices just to keep things simple so we don't have to dynamically allocate an array. We're going to faithfully stick to the meaning of an adjacency list here. So we just have an array of n standard forward lists. So we use standard forward list because that's just a singly linked list, like in our definition of an adjacency list. So now to add an edge between vertices i and j, we just do a push front on the list corresponding to vertex i and add j to its list of out adjacent neighbors. If the graph is undirected, then we also add i to the list of j's neighbors. That's again done in this if statement. So we see that add edge can be done in constant time, as push front on a linked list is just a constant time operation. To check if there is an edge between vertex i and j is a bit different in the adjacency list representation. So here we're going to have this for loop where we have to cycle through the list for vertex i searching for a node with vertex j. So this is actually a fairly slow operation. It takes time proportional to the degree of vertex i. So there's the running time of the isEdge function. Let's compare the adjacency matrix and adjacency list representations of a graph. Say that we have a graph with n vertices and m edges. The adjacency matrix representation is always going to take memory proportional to n squared, regardless of the number of edges, because we have to store an n by n matrix. With the adjacency list, on the other hand, each edge appears in exactly one list in the directed case, or in exactly two lists in the undirected case. Either way, the total number of nodes in all the linked lists is proportional to the number of edges. We also need to store an array of size n, regardless of the number of edges, because even if a vertex has no incident edges, we, we have to indicate that 
like an example here with vertex one, we indicate uh, that it has no out adjacent neighbors uh, just by having an empty list there. So the total amount of memory we need to store an adjacency list is proportional to the number of vertices plus the number of edges. For adding an edge, we have seen that this can be done in constant time in both the adjacency matrix and adjacency list representations. A major difference between the two representations is in determining if there is an edge between two vertices i and j. This can be done just in constant time in the adjacency matrix model, but in the worst case can take time proportional to the degree of one of the vertices in the adjacency list model because we have potentially have to cycle through all the neighbors of that vertex. The most important operation for us will be listing all the out adjacent vertices to a particular vertex V. In the adjacency matrix model, this takes time proportional to the number of vertices because we have to iterate over the entire row of the matrix corresponding to vertex V. In the adjacency list model, on the other hand, this only takes time proportional to the degree of V. So this is the main reason why we're going to use the adjacency list model for all the algorithms we, we give in our course. So again, for our algorithms, the main operation that we're going to, to need is this operation of iterating over all the vertices adjacent to a given vertex. Before we leave the adjacency matrix model, let me just say a couple of nice things about it. Typically, you only want to use the adjacency matrix model when the number of vertices in is small or when the graph is dense, that is, when the number of edges is a constant fraction times n squared. In the dense case, both the adjacency matrix and adjacency list formulations are going to take memory proportional to n squared. So this is no longer a reason to prefer the adjacency list over the adjacency matrix. In fact, in the adjacency list, you also have to store pointers in the linked list. So in the dense case, the adjacency matrix formulation might even be more memory efficient than the adjacency list formulation. A further benefit of the adjacency matrix model is that you can use a contiguous memory layout which can make iterating over all the edges in the graph faster than in an adjacency list. And finally, in the adjacency matrix, of course, you can check the presence or absence of an edge in constant time, which you can't do in the adjacency list model. It's somewhat surprising, however, that this does not turn out to be much of an advantage because we rarely use this operation in our algorithms. My final advice to you is to be flexible in the data structure you use to represent a graph. The adjacency matrix and adjacency list models are by far the two most standard models used in the theoretical analysis of graph algorithms. But once you get into the actual details of coding up the data structure in C++, you quickly find that you have many possible design options. So for example, why don't we take an array of standard sets instead of linked lists. What if we did that? What would that give us? Okay, so here's some example code, uh, and you see that now we actually have an array of standard sets. And we might call this the adjacency set representation of a graph. Okay, so now if we want to insert, uh, add an edge to our graph, all we have to do is call the insert operation on the appropriate set. So this now becomes an order in order login time operation. And to determine if there is an edge between two vertices, in C20, we can just use the contains member function of standard set. For earlier versions of C, we can use the find member function. Either way, the time to check for an edge in adjacency set becomes order log the degree of i rather than proportional to the degree of i as we had in the adjacency list model. 
So you see that with an adjacency set, we get a much faster time for determining if there is an edge between two vertices. And we still achieve overall memory usage proportional to the number of vertices plus the number of edges. We could even replace the standard set here with a standard unordered set to get both the add edge and is edge times down to constant, albeit there we'd have the caveat that it'd be constant time and an average and amortized sense. So after seeing this example of an adjacency set, you might ask yourself the question, why do we use an adjacency list at all? Well, part of the reason is certainly historical. Adjacency lists have been studied for a long time now, and they're firmly entrenched in the theory of graph algorithms. I would say that adjacency lists are also interesting because they are a fairly weak model. It is interesting to formulate our algorithms with the bare minimum of operations needed. This allows the algorithms to be applied in a greater variety of situations. And again, as I've mentioned, the key primitive we're going to need in our algorithms is to iterate through all the neighbors of a vertex. So the adjacency list model is going to be just fine to do our algorithms in. To bring this point home, let's return to the example of the Rubik's cube graph. Now, clearly we cannot explicitly store this entire graph. But since in our algorithms, all we need to do is to iterate through the neighbors of a given vertex, this is actually something that we can easily do in the Rubik's cube graph. Every vertex in this graph just has a constant number of neighbors. And given a vertex that is given a particular configuration of the cube, we can easily enumerate through all of its neighbors. This means that we're going to be able to run our algorithms on the Rubik's cube graph, even though we cannot explicitly store the graph. This is a very important point and can greatly enhance the applicability of our algorithms.